Lesson 6 for November 3 through to 9, Images of Unity, Sabbath afternoon, November 3. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're studying about unity as we find it in the New Testament, but also as we find it through the rest of the Bible as well. And as we open your word this week, we just want to thank you that you are the one who not only created us, but provided salvation and also provides your presence with us all day, every day through your Holy Spirit. Please be with us today as we open your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Let's read that again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. As anyone who has studied the Bible knows, it is filled with images and symbols that point to realities greater than those images and symbols themselves. For instance, the essence of the whole biblical sacrificial system is, in a sense, symbolic of the much greater reality, Jesus and the entire plan of salvation. Many other kinds of images are used in the Bible and sometimes from the most basic elements too, such as water, fire, wind. Depending upon the context, these are images for spiritual and theological truths. For example, when Jesus said in John 3 verse 8, The wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The wind was used as a symbol for the Holy Spirit. The Bible uses a number of images to describe the kind of unity we find in the church, the unity that God calls it to manifest before the world. Each individual image is not complete in and of itself. Instead, as a whole, these images reveal many things about church unity, such as the church's relationship to God, the members' relationship to one another, and the church's relationship to the community as a whole. This week's lesson will look at some of the images and what they reveal to us about unity in Christ. Sunday, November 4, The People of God Question, read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Exodus 19, 5 and 6, Deuteronomy 4, 20 and Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. What do these verses say about the special status of the people of God? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. And Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my com covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 4, verse 20, But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be his people and inheritance as you are this day. And Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, For you are, are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples in the face of the earth. The church is about people, but not any kind of people. The church is the people of God. 
the people who belong to God, who claim God as their Father and Saviour, and who have been redeemed by Christ, and who obey Him. This image underscores the concept that God has had a people on earth since the introduction of the plan of salvation, and that there is continuity between Israel in the Old Testament and the Church in the New. From the time of Adam, the patriarchs before and after the flood, and Abraham, God has made a covenant with his people to be representatives of his love, mercy, and justice in the world. God's people are called a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. These terms indicate that they are set aside for a special purpose to, as it says in 1 Peter 2.9, proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. This is also an echo of a description of God's gracious character, as described in Exodus 34 verses 6 and 7. And the Lord passed before him, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And then from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 562, God acquired the Church as His own special possession, in order that its members might reflect His precious traits of character in their own lives, and proclaim His goodness and mercy to all men. End of quote. Question. Read Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through to 8. What prompted God to select the descendants of Abraham as his people? How is this still applicable today? Deuteronomy 7, beginning at verse 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Perhaps we could ask ourselves... What country today deserves the label of holy nation, another image of the church? None. All nations and ethnic groups are composed of people who do not deserve God's love and grace. And, though the Bible calls us to be a holy people, Scripture also teaches that the selection and establishment of Israel was based entirely on his love, and not on any merits that human beings could bring to him. The formation of God's people is an act of loving creation, and despite sin and apostasy on a national scale, God kept his promise to Abraham that through his seed, Christ, he would save his people, just as the election of God's people was an act of his grace, so is their salvation. This theme reminds us of our common roots in the unmerited grace of God. So to finish today, why must we always keep before us the sacred truth that our salvation rests upon what Christ has done for us and not upon what we can ever do for ourselves, even if we are the people of God? Monday, November 5, The Household of God Another image of the people of God in the New Testament is the house or household of God. It is a metaphor of stones and buildings that highlights the intricate and interdependent nature of human relationships in the church. Peter refers to Christians as living stones in 1 Peter 2 verse 5. 
This metaphor contains a quality of permanency and solidity. Question. Read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. What key ideas does Paul emphasize in this passage? What does this image tell us about unity in the church? Ephesians 2, verses 19 to 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit." In this passage, Paul combines two images of the church, one inert, a house or building, the other alive, a household of people. A stone is not very valuable by itself, but when it is bonded with other stones, it becomes a structure that can withstand the storms of life. No Christian can be a stone alone, but must be associated with others in the fellowship of the household of God. For an edifice to be solid, it must rest on a strong foundation. Jesus Christ is this foundation and the cornerstone of the house of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The church also would cease to exist if it did not make Christ the cornerstone of its activities. The church is really about Jesus Christ, his life, death, resurrection and return. The church forms a community of believers united to share the good news about Jesus to the world. The church's agenda is Jesus, who he is, what he has done for us and does in us, and what he offers to anyone who will accept him as Lord and Saviour. The image of a household also is very meaningful. This one rests on the relationships people have among themselves. It is a familiar image of father and mother, brothers and sisters. Ties between family members can be strong, and the accompanying loyalties often transcend all other outside ties. Loyalty is a big part of unity, but how could there be any kind of unity without loyalty as well? How does this image relate to the church? Church members also are part of one big family. We are linked not only because we belong to the human family through our common ancestor Adam, but also because we are related to Jesus, the second Adam, through our common new birth experience. Thus, we become united with each other, not just because of the doctrinal truths that we hold in common, but also in the experience of being converted souls who have a new life in Jesus. And so, to finish today... Sadly, not everyone has had a great experience with his or her own family. Hence, that image might not mean much to them. How, though, can we as a church become the family that these people never had? Tuesday, November 6, The Temple of the Holy Spirit Another building imagery Paul uses is that of the Temple of God, or of the Holy Spirit. It is the image of a costly and valuable building. Along with 1 Corinthians 6.19, where the image refers to one's personal body as the Temple of the Holy Spirit, Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 uses the image to refer to the most holy and precious edifice of the ancient Near East, God's temple. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 reads, And do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? 
Question. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. What does it mean that the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit? What is Paul warning about in verse 17? 1 Corinthians 3, beginning at verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Obviously, Paul does not, in referring to the church, have in mind a physical temple or place of residence for God. The Greek of the New Testament makes a distinction between a you singular in order to refer to one person and a you plural in order to refer to many people. In this case, it is the latter. This metaphor refers to a corporate entity. Together, the Christians in Corinth form the temple of the Holy Spirit. And in a spiritual sense, God resides among them. For Paul, God resides within the Christian fellowship. Hence, his warning that anyone who attempts to destroy this fellowship will suffer the consequences of the judgment. The unity of the believers is at the core of this fellowship of God's presence in his temple. Though this text is often used in the sense of taking care of one's physical body, which is, of course, what Christians are supposed to do anyway, that's not the specific point that Paul was making here. His message was, instead, a warning about those who would destroy the unity of the church. Earlier in the chapter, Paul referred to what he considers as challenges to unity in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 3. For where there are envy, strife and divisions among you. These attitudes and behaviours are real threats to Christian unity and cause the withdrawal of God's presence from His temple. In other words, conflicts in the church can destroy God's temple. Thus, he wants members to put away the attitudes and behaviours that do threaten its unity. When conflicts erupt in the church, Paul's advice to the Corinthians is still applicable today in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And so to finish today, envy, strife and division... These are not just problems the church faced in Paul's day. We face them today as well. What role does each one of us have in seeking to work through these problems in ways that will not threaten our unity? Wednesday, November 7, The Body of Christ Perhaps the best-known image of the Church, and one that speaks the strongest about the unity of its varied parts, is the Body of Christ. 1 Corinthians twelve, twelve, and 27 read, For as the body is one, and has many members, but all the members are that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Just as a body is a single unit that is made up of many different parts, each with its different function and responsibility, this is the church as the body of Christ. Question. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through to 26. How does this image of one body with many parts apply to your local congregation? How does it apply to a worldwide organization like the Seventh Day Adventist Church? First Corinthians chapter twelve, beginning at verse twelve. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, 
but many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And, if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, on these we bestow greater honour. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honour to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honoured, all the members rejoice with it. Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 conveys the profound reality that authentic Christian unity is not just in diversity, and certainly not despite diversity, but rather through diversity. We should not be surprised that it is the Holy Spirit who is the source of these expressions of diversity. Just as the human body is both incredibly unified and amazingly diverse, so ideally is the body of Christ, which, through this diversity, expresses the completeness and richness of the body of Christ. This image speaks directly to us as a church. In the past few decades, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has grown by leaps and bounds. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is composed of people from almost every conceivable background, culture and environment. Our ethnic, racial, cultural, educational and age differences must not be permitted to divide us in Christ. If anything, this diversity should be moulded by the Holy Spirit as a force for unity, revealing the truth that despite these differences, we are all one in Christ. As we have seen, at the foot of the cross, we are all equal, regardless of who we are or where we come from. As the world around us becomes more and more fragmented, the Church must demonstrate that unity in diversity is attainable. God's people can demonstrate the healing and reconciling power of the gospel. Amazingly, Paul tells us how this ideal can be accomplished. Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body, Ephesians 5.23. And he is the head of the body, the church, in Colossians 1 verse 18. As each believer is spiritually connected to Christ, the entire body is therefore nourished with the same food. We cannot then overemphasize the importance of the study of the Word of God, obedience to what we learn in the Word, and the common experience of worship and prayer for unity in the body of Christ. Thursday, November 8, Sheep and Shepherd Question. Read John chapter 10, verses 1 through to 11. What aspects of this metaphor of the church as a sheepfold speak of unity? Also look at Psalm 23. John 10, beginning at verse 1. Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. 
To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And then Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for ever. In the modern world of large cities, it has become very rare to see animal husbandry of any kind. Most people now know little of the relationship between sheep and shepherds. However, when Jesus told this parable, people understood him well. When he said, I am the good shepherd, they immediately recognized and appreciated his reference to Psalm 23 verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd. The image was not only clear, but also full of emotional value that made it vivid. In ancient Near Eastern culture, and still today in the Middle East, shepherds are known to be dedicated to the care of their sheep, regardless of the challenges. The figure of shepherd has become one of the dearest images used in Scripture to describe the character of God and his relationship to his people. The image of God's people as sheep is an interesting image. One impression we often have of sheep is their harmless and defenceless nature. Thus, they are dependent on a good shepherd for protection and guidance. They are, quite frankly, seen as stupid. Sometimes, inadvertently, sheep get lost, and the shepherd will seek them and bring them back to the fold. Young sheep often need to be carried and require extra care. Patience and understanding is needed to care for sheep. In many ways, this is a perfect image to represent the church. The church member has nothing to fear, but everything to gain in a relationship with the shepherd. Jesus also emphasized in this parable the importance for the sheep to listen to the voice of the shepherd. When the conditions require it, it is possible to protect a few flocks of sheep by placing them in the same enclosure or sheepfold. How can they be separated later? All that is required is for the shepherd to stand at the door of the enclosure and call. His sheep will recognize his voice and come to him. John 10.4 reads, And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Listening to the voice of the shepherd is crucial for the church. In fact, the unity and safety of the people of God depend on their proximity to him and directly are related to their submissive obedience to his voice. And so to finish the day, People don't generally like to be depicted as sheep. Nevertheless, why is that such an appropriate metaphor for us? What should this image tell us about our need of the shepherd and our need to obey his voice?
Friday, November 9. John McVeigh, in his article Biblical Metaphors for the Church, Building Blocks for Ecclesiology, writes, In the context of the temple in Jerusalem, as well as the ubiquitous Greco-Roman structures, New Testament authors employ the temple metaphor to enable believers to visualize the sanctity of the church, God's role in founding and growing of the church, the defining nature of the work of Christ and the Spirit, and the solidarity of believers within the church. The architecture domain would seem to imply a static image. However, the metaphor is used in conjunction with biological imagery, and the process of building is often accentuated. Rather than a static image, we are impelled to visualize a story of the process of construction rather than a completed edifice. The Church is granted the wondrous privilege of humbly acknowledging, in its life and story, the temple of of the Living God, and that was published by Angel Manuel Rodriguez as the editor in Message, Mission and Unity of the Church, published in 2013 and page 52. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, reflect on the biblical images of the Church. Which one do you like most? Why are you more attracted to that one? Some other metaphors of the church can be found in these passages, 1 Timothy 3.15, 2 Timothy 2, 3-5, and 1 Peter 2.9. What else do these metaphors teach about the church? First of all, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth, and Second Timothy 2, verses 3 to 5. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And First Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Question 2. God wants his people to be united in the closest bonds of Christian fellowship. Confidence in our brethren is essential to the prosperity of the church. Union of action is important in a religious crisis. One imprudent step, one careless action, may plunge the church into difficulties and trials from which it may not recover for years. And that's Ellen White writing in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 446. The question is, what should this warning teach us about how careful we must seek to be in guarding the unity of the church? What role does each one of us have in this sacred responsibility? 3. Sunday study stressed that even as the people of God, we must rely only on God's grace for salvation and never on our own merits. In fact, couldn't you even argue that it's our very reliance on God's merit for salvation that indeed makes us the people of God? Is this a valid claim? Why or why not? And to summarise this week's lesson, the New Testament uses different metaphors to illustrate both the nature and mission of the church. More important, these metaphors teach that God attentively is watching over his people and protects them. These images also teach that God's people are intricately linked with each other and that we need each other to do the work that we have been called to do. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled The Book Smuggler, and it's by Vladimir Borisov. 
After attending a pastor's conference in another country, friends asked me to take a box of 100 religious books back home. I wanted to help, but my country strictly controls the distribution of religious literature. I'll take the box of books only if the bus driver agrees to assume responsibility for it, I told my friends. Bus drivers often agree to carry extra cargo in exchange for a cash payment, and my bus driver agreed to help for 100 US dollars. A friend and I boarded the bus and settled in for the long ride. Arriving at the border at night, the driver approached me for information about the box. He wanted to know how to speak with the border guards. When I told him that the box contained Christian books, he pulled the $100 bill from his pocket and handed it back to me. It's easier for me to smuggle cocaine than Christian books across the border, he said. My friend and I had no choice. We knelt beside the bus and repacked the books into our suitcases. Then we prayed as we joined the line of passengers at the border crossing. The person ahead of us put his bags on the scanner belt and walked through customs. Then we put our suitcases on the belt. The border guard pressed the button to start the belt, but it didn't move. He pushed the button again. He pounded the button and swore. Still, the belt didn't move. The border guard looked at us. Fine, go, he said, motioning for us to take our suitcases from the belt. Minutes later, my friend and I walked to the second border post to enter my home country. We put our suitcases on the belt, and the guard pressed the button. Nothing happened. He began to swear, and he finally turned to us. Just go, he said. Only after crossing the border did we dare to look back. The guard had stopped the next person and was inspecting her bags manually. We thanked God as we sank into our bus seats. On Sabbath, a church member had a strange story to tell. A voice had awakened her at night, saying, Pray for your pastor. She hadn't known that I was travelling and thought that I was at home asleep. The voice came again, Pray for your pastor. Finally, she knelt and prayed for an hour. I asked when she had heard the voice. It was the exact hour that my friend and I had crossed the border. Although I cannot name my country, please pray for God's work. Thank you for giving mission offerings to bring the message of salvation to many around the world. You have been listening to a reading of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide by Dr. Percy Harold from Queensland, Australia. This service is brought to you by Hope Channel, the Sabbath School Department and Christian Services for the Blind. Remember, God is always faithful.